So um, it's my pleasure to be talking about the policy and ep epidemiology of mandates in the US um, and Europe. So uh, the principles are applicable to a lot of other high and middle income settings and would be happy to um, discuss how some of this work translates into low income settings in the, in the question and answer session. So before we start, we did an evidence synthesis of what is the proportion, what is the contributions of vaccine refusal, specifically vaccine exemptions to mandates in the U.S. since elimination between 2000, uh, you know, elimination of measles in the U.S. from 2000 through 2015 when we did this analysis. And we found that of those who were, of, of the measles cases that were occurring, that are occurring in the U.S., of those, approximately 70 percent, uh, the cases that were eligible for vaccination, 70 percent was unvaccinated um, for due to and, and were unvaccinated were due to non-medical exemptions. And there were 43 percent um, of the total group of uh, cases when you added too young to be vaccinated as well. But also there is a contribution of vaccine refusal as measured by vaccine exemptions in the U.S. in terms of um, dynamics of some of these outbreaks. And, and so like all God-fearing epidemiologists, I love epidemic curves. And we created a cumulative e epidemic curve from the outbreaks where these data were available, anchored on day one, and looked at what was the contribution of unvaccinated, primarily due to vaccine refusal, in at different stages of these outbreaks. And what we found was that obviously most of the cases were in the early parts or like in the first four weeks. And if you look at these contribution, these proportions by time of outbreak, those who were uh, refusing vaccines or were exempt contributed disproportionately in the early part of these epidemics. So they provide that, that tinder, not that kind of tinder, but you know, the tinder that starts the fire um, in terms of providing that critical mass for starting and contributing to these outbreaks. Vaccine requirements or mandates, I use the word interchangeably, requirements and mandates, and the reason we, in, in the early part of our work, I preferred the term requirements. I use the term mandates uh, a little bit more now because it's part of the discourse so that I want to make sure sometimes, you know, you give a talk on requirements and people ask you, so what about mandates? Uh, so it is, you know, in this context, broadly similar overlapping con uh, concepts. So requirements of mandate do fairly reasonably well compared to the overall um, group of interventions in this area. So this really nice review led by Noel Brewer and uh, a lot of people like, uh, you know, that are in this field, prominent people like Julie Lees contributed to it and found that uh, structural interventions and interventions that directly impact behavior, such as immunization requirements, were particularly impactful based on the current evidence. That does not mean that other interventions cannot have uh, impact as the emer evidence emerges. That does not mean that um, these are, you know, mandates or requirements are the panacea for our, uh, all our worries in this area. But it does highlight that there are a legitimate policy option. And, in and, there, and because of the evidence, they should be at the table where it is warranted. And I'll, I'll add a few nuances to this. In the U.S., where most of the, or a lot of the work has come out of, uh, these are school-based requirements based on state laws, uh, and that provide us variability in terms of measuring the impact of different versions of these laws. And they have played a major role in lowering and keeping low the uh, rates of vaccine-preventable diseases. But they allow for three types of exemptions, medical exemptions for medical contraindications, religious exemptions and per personal belief exemptions that are sometimes called philosophical exemptions. And I you know, find it a little bit odd because uh, philosophical implies a little bit of rationality to me, which is not always the case. You see, we have a philosopher in the room. Um, when we started, like, you know, when we were doing this work, um, we started looking at, we updated a CDC scale of, um, uh, that looked at different types of exemptions. I'll come to that in a second, but there's another taxonomy 
of religious only exemptions, religious and philosophical or personal belief. Philosophical and personal belief is uh, used more or less interchangeably um, in this context, and no exemptions. So there are three states uh, that until recently, now New York has been added and Maine has done uh, 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 changed their laws, but in terms of the actual data being available post intervention is not there yet for these some of the newer states, and Washington has a, a bit of a nuanced uh, change in law uh, that I couldn't go into the detail in the discussion section. So in this uh, US, there are three states that have no exemptions for non-medical reasons, but others have a flavor of um, religious only and religious and philosophical exemptions. But there's another way to look at it, and California at that time was one of the easiest states to get an exemption. Um, and the, we updated, as I said, a CDC scale that looked at the difficulty um, of obtaining exemptions that came out uh, of paper from, by Jennifer Rota uh, in the late 90s. We updated it for the internet era, and essentially the principle is that the balance of convenience is evaluated based on the procedural difficulty of obtaining an exemption from a requirement. And so they are, we cl classify them as easy, medium, difficult. And the example is in, in certain states, you can just go on, a, on the internet, print a PDF, check off the box, and submit it to the school district, and you're golden for the, your stay in that school district, uh, you know, while your kid is in that school district. Um, and, and in other states, you have to go through physician counseling, sometimes notarization, and you know, write your reason for getting your child vaccinated, or exempt, et cetera. So when we looked at the impact of ease of exemptions, we found that even after adjusting pretty aggressively of uh, these, um, pretty aggressively in terms of baseline demographic characteristics between states, that there was an impact on disease rates. And we did intentionally did this analysis at the state level because we already had data in the individual level. For example, previously it had been shown that the risk of measles is 36, 35, 36 times higher if your child, individual risk, if your child was exempt versus vaccinated. Um, the reason, and, and the, the risk of pertussis, individual risk of pertussis was approximately five to six times higher, not percent, times higher if you uh, were exempt versus vaccinated. The reason we did it at the state level is because the policies are made at the state level. And this attracted some attention and, and, and sort of informed some policy making and recommendation. So that was the overall effect on disease rates. However, we wanted to see whether these rates were getting worse. So earlier on, uh, we, we looked at non-medical exemptions by year. There was a little bit of a trend, but not that stark. Until we categorized by religious only, versus personal belief exemptions. And it was clear that states that had philosophical and personal belief exemptions versus religious only were seeing an increase. Similarly, states that had easy exemption policy not only had higher rate of exemptions, but had uh, an increase in um, exemption rates that was happening. And we looked at uh, subsequent data, those were through 2007, what we found was that um, when we categorized subsequently by philosophical exemption versus religious exemption, while the rates were still higher in philosophical exemption rates, the states with religious exemptions were catching up. And that was concerning. So that prophylaxis, if you will, the policy prophylaxis of having a religious-only uh, exemption was becoming a little less effective at the, at the population level. But there was still, if you will, a little bit of protection against that increase if you had difficult exemption policy. But policy is made at the state level, at least in the US, at the government level, at, at the jurisdiction level, and disease transmission happens at a very local level. So we wanted to see whether uh, there was a local effect of vaccine exemptions or vaccine refusals. Uh, we looked at the clustering of vaccine refusal and the overlap of vaccine refusal as measured by exemptions uh, and pertussis uh, clusters. We call them clusters because these were recognized and unrecognized outbreaks. And we found 
that there was indeed an overlap. And if you were in a census tract, which is a geographic aggregation used in the US, internally homogeneous geographic aggregation used in the US, if you were in a, if you, if you were a census tract in an exemption clusters, you, the odds of that same exemption tract being in, in a pertussis clusters was almost three times as high as a census tract that was outside an exemption cluster. So the question was, was there anything weird about Michigan? These were Michigan data. That might be true, Mark. Um, but uh, there are other things that were going on, and these results were replicated more or less in California as well. And so this evidence and many other groups' evidence um, informed uh, thinking that making, uh, adding procedural difficulty to the exemption process may have some policy value. And Washington State um, did, uh, you know, modified their law and said that educational counseling signed uh, from a licensed provider in Washington was now needed if you wanted to file a non-medical exemption to these requirements. So this kind of uh, intervention specifically has potential persuasion value, uh, although it hasn't been directly measured in the context of uh, Washington, but we are actually doing a separate trial to see whether it has an independent persuasion value, these kinds of things, versus, plus an, a procedural um, difficulty uh, imperative as well. And when they came, their uh, law became, came in effect in July 2011, and when we evaluated it, we found that there was substantial reduction, approximately 42, 43% reduction in their vaccine refusal rates. And it was actually observed uh, in, in terms of most individual vaccine uptake as well. They gained of almost a, a decade in terms of their uh, vaccine uh, refusal rates uh, as measured by exemption. However, in Washington state particularly, and, and that's true for most regions, there is substantial geographic heterogeneity in vaccine refusal rates and exemption rates. And for example, in this state, um, in 2006, 2007, before the intervention happened, there was, uh, the, the rates were approximately, exemption rates were 1.2% in one of their counties, the Yakima counties, and up to one in four child being exempt to one vaccine, to, uh, one vaccine or another in the Ferry County. So there was substantial uh, heterogeneity. So it's, it was very important to us to measure this, the impact of this intervention on geographic heterogeneity of exemptions in Washington state. So if you see, it's you, the, the, these uh, set of heat maps are read from left to right and top to bottom. There was an increase in not just rates, but clustering of these rates. So the risk goes, becomes even higher if these people who refuse vaccines are clustered together, and they provide that critical mass that I talked about. And until 2010, 2011, and there was an impact on clustering, but the clusters were not totally eliminated. And one of the clusters sits um, in the southern part uh, of Washington, and this is where we saw this, the recent outbreak. Uh, and so we did alert to this possibility that there are residual clusters uh, that could still pose a risk. But then California went all out and eliminated all non-medical exemptions. But it wasn't the only intervention they had. It's a series of interventions that California had. And this is the laser pointer, correct? Yeah. So they had this law, AB 2109, which is essentially very similar to the Washington law of adding uh, physician counseling. Then they had a crackdown, oh sorry. They had a crackdown on what's called conditional entrance. So these were, uh, people were temporarily allowed into school. You know, the, the original intent was that, you know, um, I'm gonna get my child vaccinated. They have started their schedule, pinky promise, they will comply. But did, that often didn't happen. That was an out for a lot of uh, parents that uh, schools gave them. And there was a little bit of a crackdown. Crackdown is, is perhaps a strong word, but there was an educational campaign, by the, an administrative campaign, to say that these need, rates need to come out and uh, schools need to stick closer to the intent of this uh, option. So that happened, and then the famous SB 277 happened, where all non-medical exemptions were eliminated. 
And so what happened after that? So at the bottom, our personal belief exemptions, they went down because they were not allowed anymore. There was an increase, substantial relative increase in medical exemption. And there's been a lot of focus on that. And I'll show you data before that, that we actually said that this, this wouldn't be surprising, before the law uh, was passed, that this will go up. But then there was an increase in, um, in, in this category where mandates were not applicable. So they created this category if you were homeschooled or you were part of an independent study program, which is a hybrid between true homeschooling and actual um, uh, you know, uh, school-based learning, they still have similar risks of transmission and, uh, of disease. Uh, there was this increase in this category, and that kind of exploded in a relative sense. And then there was this other category, which was called overdue, which is basically, I hate to say, but people kind of ignoring the law. Um, uh, and it wasn't violating the law intently, but you know these kinds of mass uh, interventions are hard to apply. And so that increased. There was an overall increase in coverage in California. So there was an increase, but the biggest increase came, uh, that increase is likely to have come through the drop in conditional entrance. So the administrative effort seemed to be more effective and actually was the reason this was a, almost, if you look at this, this was almost a total wash within two years of the replacement mechanisms. However, if you look at the different eras and clustering, so this was the Southern California clusters, uh, set of clusters uh, in, that uh, received a lot of coverage because it's close to Hollywood and, and a lot of media is, uh, the West Coast media is centered around that um, um, region and because that becomes more of a story, the Disneyland outbreak happened in this area as well. After the first intervention, the pre-intervention, th these were the clusters. In the initial interventions, actually the clustering didn't get impacted. But then after the SP277 and the cumulative effect of conditional entrance, there was indeed an impact on clustering. So this is non-medical exemption data beforehand. Before this law was passed, what we found was that states that had difficult uh, and medium uh, non-medical exemption category had relatively higher rates of medical exemptions. It wasn't a total wash at the national level, but it wasn't totally unexpected. And some people were uh, actually, uh, you know, namely us and others, were talking about the possibility of increase in medical exemptions. And not a, we were not expecting a total wash because at the national level, uh, it wasn't, um, the data weren't there to support that, but you, there was, you know, it's like when you turn down a pressure valve, sometimes the water comes out from the, uh, or if you shut down the pressure valve, valve, the water comes out from the other side. There's this other, this, this is brand new data um, done by a postdoc um, uh, that she collaborates and works with our group um, and house uh, where looked at uh, you know, the various vaccine adverse event reporting system data in California and say what happened after SB277 and reporting of uh, adverse events. And so if you look at it, there was an increase, at least a transient increase, a pretty substantial increase in reporting uh, these, um, uh, these adverse events. However, we had a control state of Texas to see whether it was California specific or did it happen elsewhere. You can see there was a contact. This was Texas was chosen as, a, as an example of another big state, and at least at the broad trend level, you would find, if, if it was a broader phenomenon, you would find uh, a broad increase. But this increase was California-specific. So now switching to Europe, we did an assessment of European data, and we found that even in Europe, uh, if you look at mandatory vaccination, and, and these paper, this paper is, uh, is about to come out, uh, and you look, there was uh, an association with three percentage, approximately four percentage points, higher coverage of measles. It doesn't look dramatically different, but it's substantial at a population level, especially if you're hovering close to the herd immunity threshold in different populations and subpopulations. However, mandatory vaccination without non-medical ex uh, exemptions did not have any added benefit, even in the European context. Um, uh, on the other hand, Financial penalty with each 500 euros, there was approximately 0.8 percentage point uh, increase, at least for measles coverage. Similar trend overall for pertussis as well, but uh, the, the, the results 
uh, um, uh, the confidence intervals cross the null in terms of the other uh, um, category where mandatory vaccination was there without non-medical exemption. So as I sort of wind down the evidence part uh, you know, of this presentation, one of the things that I want to show you is that often when these laws are passed, we look at these snapshots, which is dangerous in the sense that we say, okay, kindergartens coming in now would all be uh, vaccinated because we eliminated uh, this provision or made it harder to get vaccinated. But that's not a, a very sort of sound epidemiological approach because kids who are there in the school system in previous years are already there. They're still there. And they don't go away. They continue to con contribute to the these clusters of uh, vulnerability. And so therefore, it's a good program indicator to look at a, a snapshot each year, but it's not a good epidemiological indicator of risk at the population level. And so we did uh, sort of a modeling exercise. This paper is also uh, uh, coming out in the next few months. And what we found was that it would take, and sorry, most of my slides are legible uh, at distance, but this one isn't. So I'll go through um, uh, you know, the salient point. And the salient point is that if you don't, uh, have a catch-up program with your intervention, it takes approximately six to seven years to get to a coverage that is desirable to control outbreaks. So this is a nuance both in terms of the policy level, but also policy evaluation level. So if you expect to see an impact on outbreaks right away in a situation where you have eliminated uh, a provision and you don't have a catch-up program, uh, you have uh, issues with this. So how do we deal with this in terms of procedural difficulty? So I laid out a few years ago um, an approach, uh, sign a form that discussed the risks of non-vaccination, so um, informed declination, ideally by a, a, a well-qualified provider. In-person counseling, that's super important, it's super helpful. Procedures to review each request for exemption. So it shouldn't be a pro forma thing that you file this and it is accepted. And we in separately talked about financial mod models for making this part sustainable for health departments. A letter elaborating on the reason their child should be exempt. It used to be more useful in the pre-internet era. Now there are form letters available. So obtain the form by specifically request from the state health, uh, health department or local uh, health departments versus downloading it online. So look, a parent who's complying with the immunization schedule has to go through at least five visits where they take time off work, they sit through the wait in the doctor's office, they fill out the same stupid form again that they filled out a few uh, you know, months ago with the same information that hasn't changed uh, and go through the same process and contribute to the individual protection but also to the community protection. If a society, most people are complying that, and especially in a democratic society, the will is that if you're gonna opt out of that social norm, at least go through some minimal procedural um, sort of difficulty is very reasonable, and this is part of that. And then annual renewal. It shouldn't be uh, you know, one and done. If vaccines require multiple efforts by those who comply, uh, to to get to stay up to date, it's reasonable to say that this request should be reviewed. And there are other public health imperatives for this review. So I had the privilege of uh, working with my colleagues, uh, Cornelia Besch and, and, and Julie Leesk, to outline some of the best practices, and I'll briefly go through this. So the this first step states should have is to ensure that access is not ignored, even in high-income settings. You, it, you can't have a system where you're just focusing on mandates without ensuring access. So ensure stable supply of vaccines, make clinics welcoming, safe, and easy to get to. Monitor safety. The burden of safety monitoring is higher when you are transiently uh, impinging on a few people's choices, which societies, including highly democratic societies, do that all the time, but it comes with, uh, you know, to quote uh, Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, and so therefore, you know, I'm told that Voltaire also say, said that, but he didn't say it in tights, but maybe he did. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, Julie's rolling her eyes. She has see, heard this joke a few times. <laughs> but but you, look, if Spider-Man can sort of live off of like five sequels with the same plot lines, I can repeat the same joke. So the second step is use multiple interventions, and that's super important. Mandates don't absolve jurisdictions and governments of a comprehensive program. They're not a cop-out. 
And specifically in low income settings, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm focusing on high and middle income settings, it should never, never, ever be used as an excuse to blame communities as whole, uh, to, to pass on responsibility of a health system. And then, uh, if you create these, ensure that procedures are fair for coming up with this uh, mandate, make penalties appropriate. The rich should not be able to buy out of, uh, of complying with the social requirement. Compensate for side effects. I'm a big proponent of an uh, injury, no-fault injury compensation program, and avoid implementing selective mandates. I'll come to that in the discussion section, uh, you know, if there's any question about it. So we formulated as, you know, some of these things are essential, even before you uh, sort of uh, uh, design a, an appropriate, ethical, pragmatic policy, and some of these things can happen in, uh, you know, concurrently. 